Right, so we'll start uh, today's session with a new lecture about uh, the EIC, and this is given by uh, Christian, uh, who's been in the theory group at JLab for 20 years. Or, and uh, yeah, we're going to have two lectures, and as always, just uh, ask all your questions at the end. Three lectures. Two, two lectures this morning and three in total. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh... Good morning, everyone, and uh, uh, welcome to the Thursday uh, edition of the school. Um, my name is uh, Christian Weiss. I, um, I'm a staff scientist here in the Theory Center. I work on hadron structure and electromagnetic scattering using a broad range of uh, theoretical methods. I've been with Jefferson Lab for 20 years, and uh, I've seen uh, many Hux schools. I know that this is a, really a, a, a great um, event, and I'm very happy to be part of that. Um, our topic uh, today, this morning, and, and, and tomorrow afternoon is uh, QCD at the Electron-Ion Collider. As you probably all know, um, the um, U.S. nuclear physics community and the Department of Energy have uh, um, um, decided to uh, construct a next-generation facility for high energy electron proton electron nucleus uh, scattering in the form of a of colliding beam facility um, with a center of mass energies um, in the range between uh, 30 and uh, up to 140 GeV. And um, this uh, new facility will enable a, um, um, a, a very um, extensive science program. And um, this is really a, 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 a a, a huge complex to cover in a lecture. It um, uh, includes the concepts, uh, the measurements, the experimental equipment, accelerator and detector, the organization, things like the EIC user group, the detector collaboration, the DOE project. So in this lecture, we will focus on the um, concepts and the measurements. And um, but even that is a is a uh, big topic, and we want to be very clear with uh, how we uh, go about this in this lecture. And um, here's kind of the like the how we how we want to um, approach this. So um, we really want to focus in this lecture on understanding and explaining uh, hadrons and nuclei as what is called emergent phenomena on Q, uh, of QCD. And our main tool here will be what is called the parton picture of, uh, of hadrons, which will be um, introduced, um, where we essentially uh, look at a, at a fast moving system, which can in many ways be um, described as a many body system in particles. And so composed of quarks and gluons, they have um, uh, physical properties. So the system has a particle content, the spatial size, internal motion, et cetera. And, um, um, we can apply many of the concepts that we have for, for more traditional uh, many-body systems using this, um, uh, this template. And um, this, um, so this will be our, our kind of central uh, uh, paradigm which we use. And um, on one hand, this picture can be um, connected with the dynamics of QCD, including the, the non-perturbative dynamics that we observe, for example, in lattice QCD calculations. And it can be uh, connected directly to the measurements we do in high energy, high momentum transfer processes. And in this way, we can really uh, close the arc and, and um, connect the measurements with um, features of QCD dynamics that we ultimately try to um, uh, understand. Now, um, uh, a few words about the style of, uh, of the presentation. Uh, we want to focus on developing the physical picture here using um, um, more like um, intuitive um, uh, reasoning. Essentially, all the concepts we need are uh, quantum mechanics and relativity. You will remember these words um, throughout the lecture. Um, and um, it, so formal derivations of the uh, structures and, um, and, and, and statements uh, presented here they can be provided. Uh, some of them will be covered in other lectures, for example, Nobuo Sato's lecture uh, uh, later in this school. But um, I think uh, 
we spend our time together best if we focus on these uh, uh, on the physical picture. This is something that can be communicated best in in human to human interaction. Formal derivations, etc. That's something you have to sit down and and work it out yourself. And um, so that's that's the plan. Now, with this in mind, um, we came up with this um, uh, outline here for this lecture. So um, we will start with a, an introduction of the concepts, QCD as a dynamical system, the parton picture of hadron structure, and the uh, um, technique of factorization and uh, parton densities. Um, we'll then have another introduction to the methods of uh, high energy electron scattering, kinematics and the cross section, energy and luminosity, and the, um, um, expert, the, the basic experimental techniques, fixed target versus colliding beam experiments. And then um, we will have a, a look at the uh, EIC physics program in uh, nucleon structure. And we'll, uh, we will go over several uh, science highlights such as the C quark and gluon polarization, orbital angular momentum in the nucleon, transverse spatial distributions of quarks and gluons, and uh, neutron structure from measurements on light nuclei. And then in the, um, in the second part, uh, which will be somewhat uh, shorter, uh, we will focus on nuclei. And we'll again have a, um, an introduction of concepts, the uh, connection between nuclear interactions and partonic structure. And, um, and we'll then go over uh, EIC um, physics applications in the field of nuclei and hadronization, which include measurements of the nuclear gluon density, the phenomena of uh, shadowing and saturation, and studies of hadronization in vacuum and in nuclei. Um, I will be very brief about the accelerator and detector side. Um, there are excellent materials out there which, we, which you can uh, uh, consume on your own. And um, we will briefly introduce the uh, organization of the EIC science effort, the user group, the EPIC collaboration, the EIC project, and uh, ways in which um, um, uh, you and all of us can get uh, involved in this. So that's the plan. Now let's start with some reflections on QCD as a dynamical system. Um, so QCD. The basic degrees of freedom in QCD are the gauge and the matter fields. Here, as you know, X here is the four-dimensional uh, space-time point. So these are functions of uh, four-dimensional space-time. And um, as we all know, the, uh, um, we can uh, project these fields on modes, like uh, plane, uh, uh, plane waves. And um, these modes of these fields can be um, as we all know, interpreted as particles, uh, which we call uh, uh, quarks and, and gluons. Um, in the case of the gauge field, um, the, uh, um, this uh, four vector here has four degrees of freedom, but only two of them correspond to physical polarization states uh, because of the constraints emerging from gauge symmetry. But um, basically, the, um, we can interpret the modes of these fields as in some sense as uh, particles, which we call quarks and gluons. Now, um, as you all know, these modes are coupled to each other um, by the interactions emerging from the gauge theory in a very beautiful, almost like geometrical way. It's all uh, dictated by the symmetry. And um, so we have these, these couplings, which you've all seen, they can be derived from the Lagrange density, et cetera, et cetera. And it's all just like textbook uh, field theory. But um, what this means in practice, these couplings is, um, is as follows. Let's, let's think about the motion of a, of a quark or gluon. Um, now, um, we have quantum mechanics, so these particles they cannot sit still, they cannot be exactly localized. They, they, um, 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 they, undergo, they, they undergo some random motion with uh, at least like an H-bar quantum uh, of, of, of action. So um, they're constantly on the move in the sense. Um, and um, 
these particles are charged. They carry color charge. And what does a moving charge do? It, it radiates. So that, that's, I mean, we know that from electrodynamics, if you have an electric charge and you, you, you accelerate it or so, it, 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 it radiates. And that's exactly what happens in this uh, uh, quantum mechanical motion in QCD. So these quarks from gluons, as they uh, exist in their quantum mechanical state, they, they, um, they constantly radiate or they, they, um, they are coupled to other modes. They constantly absorb and e emit and absorb uh, other modes. So the quantum mechanical motion of these particles involves radiation, including uh, creation and annihilation. So this is uh, like uh, processes in which uh, quark anti-quark pairs are produced, etc. And um, one thing to appreciate is this system is really essentially relativistic. Um, the typical momenta of these modes inside a hadron are of the order of the inverse hadron size. So it's like a few hundred MeV. But the rest masses of the uh, quarks are only a uh, few MeV. So this system is really in the, uh, um, as we say, essentially uh, relativistic. And the, the gluons, of course, are, are, are massless. So what this means is that um, in QCD, we cannot separate particles from the radiation that, uh, that surrounds them. They're one, they're, they're one and the same uh, thing. And, and this, will be, this will have lots of consequences um, later on, as you will see. Um, so what this means is that the, the modes in this quantum field theory really depend, the, the very definition of these modes really depends on the resolution scale um, which determines how much of the radiation surrounding these modes is included in the definition of these modes. So technically, this happens through something called renormalization. So you have to um, um, renormalize these, um, uh, uh, the amplitudes for these um, uh, emission absor absorption processes. This introduces a scale. And um, uh, what this scale means is, to, is simply that um, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of resolution scale that determines how much of that radiation we include in the, in the definition of these uh, modes. So that's a, like a, a very basic fact about QCD. Um, so the definition of the modes depends on the resolution scale. This means that also the effective coupling between these modes uh, depends on the resolution scale. And um, this is something you probably all uh, heard about. This is the, the famous uh, running coupling constant. Um, the easiest or the simplest example to, to quantify this is um, what's done here. It's where we're looking at the uh, interaction of two static walk charges. So these, these, these are uh, uh, two static color charges. We can, we can imagine them as quarks with an infinite mass. So these guys just sit there. They, they, they don't move, but they create a color field. And then we can look at the interaction of these sources as a function of the distance. So this is what would be the Coulomb potential in, 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 in uh, electrodynamics. But now in, in, in chromodynamics, it's, it's uh, kind of modified by all these um, um, quantum fluctuations. And we can derive from this an effective uh, uh, coupling. And lo and behold, you see that this effective coupling depends on the distance between these sources, which in this case defines our, our resolution scale in a way that, it, that the coupling decreases at uh, short distances. So, um, and this is the, the, the famous, uh, property of what's called asymptotic freedom, that the effective coupling between the modes in QCD depends on, uh, um, depends on the scale and decreases at short distances. Now, this um, means that um, calculations using perturbation theory, which are ba based on an expansion of the coupling constant, they are generally uh, applicable at short distances where the coupling is small. But, um, I would like to um, make a comment here. This, this um, uh, 
um, just to put this in the proper perspective, what you can see uh, from this graph here is the, the scale dependence of the coupling is actually very weak. It's logarithmic. It's of the form of like one over uh, logarithm. And as you know, the logarithm is a very, uh, very weak function. If you look here, I mean, we really have to go down two orders in magnitude in the scale for the coupling to decrease from 0.3 to 0.1. So this is a, this is not a very um, strong effect. And the statement that perturbation theory is applicable at short distances, it's, um, it should be seen in that context. It's not that the coupling suddenly becomes small and, uh, and, uh, and we can do perturbation theory. The applicability of perturbation theory is really limited by the non-perturbative effects that will be shown on the next slide. If uh, they have characteristic scales, and um, if they are present, they usually dominate. And if we're away from these non-perturbative scales, we can apply uh, perturbation theory. But that, that's just a, uh, um, a comment on, uh, on the side, because you, you hear from many people who do nothing but uh, perturbative QCD, and you hear this mantra of, oh, the coupling becomes small, we can do perturbation theory. Yes, it's true, but it has to be, uh, you have to be in a region where non-perturbative uh, effects are uh, not dominant. So um, let's go there. Let's go, let's look at QCD at larger distances, what happens there. And this is a, a very interesting, almost like a whole world uh, in itself. So um, if you look at QCD at distances of the order of the hadronic uh, scale, which is like one Fermi, we find uh, some very interesting phenomena that are non-perturbative vacuum fluctuations of the gauge fields. So very strong uh, fields that, that suddenly pop up uh, out of the vacuum, out of the, the whims of quantum mechanics. And um, they're actually, um, they can be explained as a tunneling phenomena in a uh, landscape that is defined by the topology of the gauge theory. So again, it's, it's very deeply related to the geometry of the gauge theory. Um, these fields can be, uh, uh, have been studied extensively in lattice QCD calculations. Um, they have a typical size that is still much smaller than the hadronic size, so around uh, uh, 0.3 Fermi. Um, at the same time, another uh, interesting phenomenon happens, namely a, a condensate of quark antiquark pairs develops. So these, these fields that we see here, they pop quark antiquark pairs out of the vacuum, and these pairs condense and form a, a, a um, um, what's called a, a, a condensate. And this is related to a, a, a phenomenon of spontaneous uh, symmetry breaking, which is called a spontaneous uh, of chiral symmetry, so the left-right symmetry of the uh, quarks that is broken here. And again, this has many uh, uh, um, interesting um, implications that we can't go into here. And another phenomenon that is closely related to the first two here is that uh, dynamical masses are generated uh, by, by QCD. So uh, essentially, uh, quark or gluon modes that propagate in this background populated by these non-perturbative fields, they, they behave like they have a mass. They acqu acquire dynamical mass. And this is the main reason for or, the, uh, or, or this is how the masses of light hadrons uh, emerge from uh, QCD. And this is the basis for then for what we use in, in simple pictures like the constituent quark pictures of, uh, uh, of hadrons where we work with massive quarks that have a mass of uh, around one third of the uh, nucleon mass. And if you go to even larger distances, like uh, one Fermi, we find the uh, hadron formation takes place and um, as you all know, a, a very rich spectrum of meson and baryon excitations emerges from this, um, uh, from this uh, dynamics here. So let's talk about how we um, uh, derive or think about hadron structure in, uh, QC, in, in QCD. Or, so um, the way to get hadrons out of QCD is to look at correlation functions 
of certain composite color singlet operators that have quantum numbers of mesons and baryons. Um, and these correlation functions are evaluated in the, in the vacuum state. So this is a, a, as indicated here. Formally, this is the time ordered product of two of these operators at some uh, space-time separation. And you can think of it in the following way. So we, we, uh, um, we create, um, uh, so we, we measure this, uh, this uh, correlation function. It creates some kind of uh, um, uh, like excitation in this uh, vacuum uh, populated by quantum fluctuations. And um, if we wait, uh, and, and these excitations can be projected then on the physical eigenstates, the hadronic states uh, um, of the theory. Now, this is usually done in, um, um, in, by looking at these correlation functions in imaginary time where the quantum field theory becomes like a statistical mechanics and you could do lattice simulations as you uh, heard in the uh, lecture by um, Wei Wen. And um, this is a very nice method. And one can get essentially all the, um, the hadron spectrum and hadron structure um, out of these um, uh, imaginary time uh, correlation functions. Where by hadron structure, what we mean is uh, matrix elements of certain QCD operators between, uh, between hadronic states. So this is a very nice uh, uh, method, but what we don't have in this uh, method is any kind of concept of a particle content of the hadrons. And um, the reason is uh, very simple. We cannot separate any kind of modes belonging to the hadron from vacuum fluctuations in this, uh, in this system. So um, imagine um, we observe a, a quark somewhere. Um, a, we have no way of telling whether it originated just from a vacuum fluctuation or whether it was in some sense connected with these uh, hadronic sources here. There's no, uh, they're, they're absolutely indistinguishable. So, um, um, we have no concept of a particle content in this uh, way. And, and one way of saying this is that um, a hadron in QCD in this form is not a, it's not a closed system in the quantum mechanical sense. It's coupled to the uh, vacuum fluctuations. But there is a way in which we can um, um, say make hadrons closed systems in a sense and define something like a particle content of the uh, hadrons. And this is called the, the, the parton picture. And um, the idea is that we look at a hadronic state that moves with a momentum um, that is much larger than the typical momentum in these vacuum fluctuations. So um, then, um, the following thing happens. We can separate the modes in the quantum field theory into two types. There are some modes which have a um, um, momentum, a longitudinal momentum along the hadron direction, um, which is of the order of this large momentum of the hadron, meaning that it's, it's some number x times p, where x is a number of order uh, unity. So these modes have um, momenta of the order of the hadron momentum, but then there will be other modes that have momenta just of the order of the momentum of the uh, vacuum fluctuations, which are not affected by this large P. And they're, they're kind of left behind. And you see that now in this picture, we have a kind of parametric way justified by this large momentum to separate modes belonging to the hadron from uh, um, from vacuum fluctuations. And that's the whole essence of this uh, parton picture of hadrons. So one can argue in a, in a sense that um, in this way, in, in this way of looking at it, a hadron becomes a closed system. And in a certain sense, um, which will be specified further later, it can be described by a wave function in terms of uh, quark and gluon uh, degrees of freedom, in terms of particle uh, degrees of freedom. 
So, um, but this is a very curious wave function because it has components with different particle number. So uh, you can think of it schematically as um, uh, being a whole tower of what is called Fox states, uh, starting with a minimal Fox state, say three quarks, three quarks plus an, any number of quark, anti-quark pairs, uh, uh, gluons, et cetera, et cetera. So um, here you see the essential nature of uh, quantum mechanics and relativity at work. So the wave function of this system has, um, say the number of elementary particles is not conserved, um, but they, they, the, the, the Hadron has configurations with arbitrary particle number, and they all, they're all connected by the interactions of the theory. So for example, some uh, 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 quark can couple to some vacuum field and can decay into quark, anti-quark, uh, uh, um, can produce an extra quark, anti-quark pair or gluon, et cetera. So these components are all connected by the interactions of QCD and they exist in some uh, coherent quantum mechanical superposition in this uh, uh, wave function. So um, this is the way we can actually think about um, hadrons in this, uh, in this uh, parton picture. And in this way, the, the, the hadron really becomes a many body system in, um, particle uh, degrees of freedom. And we will use that property later to, um, uh, or we, we will use that feature extensively in our further uh, discussions. Now just some word of caution, um, in QCD, this picture emerges rigorously after um, a formal step, which we call factorization and renormalization, which will be uh, discussed later. And in particular, it requires limiting the transverse momenta of these hadrons to uh, some scale that will be um, that will essentially be arbitrary and will, will um, play the role of a resolution scale. And we can study the scale dependence of this. Uh, so the wave function will be scale dependent, but in a way that is well understood and this will be uh, discussed uh, later. But for now, let's enjoy this, this uh, picture and uh, see some of the things that we can, uh, or some of the intuition we can um, derive from that. So if we follow this line of thought, we can really think of the Hadron as a many body system um, with a wave function that has um, different components. So um, there are some components of the wave function that have a few particles with large fractional momentum X of order one. So for example, three valence quarks, uh, which whose, whose X values have to add up to one to the total uh, momentum of the, um, uh, of the hadron or three valence quarks plus one quark anti-quark pair, et cetera. But there can also be components with many particles with small X, much less than one. And um, um, so you, you, you see some, uh, um, obvious connection here. So the, the, in each configuration of this wave function, the number of constituents, their, 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 lo their longitudinal momenta have to add up to the total longitudinal momentum of the, uh, of the hadron. So um, you can have uh, only a few particles with X of order one, and you can have many particles uh, with X much, uh, much less than one. And as we said earlier, these configurations exist in a, in a happy quantum mechanical superposition and they're connected by the, by the interactions um, uh, in the system. And um, this, um, so in this way we can um, identify some really distinct regions in, in Hadron structure. Um, so there is the region of uh, what we call valence quarks, which carry X values around uh, of, of order one, typically around uh, 0.3 or so. Uh, in this region, the system more or less behaves like a few body system and, and all this, uh, what you heard about the quark model, et cetera, this all can, all this, this um, intuition can be applied here. If we look into the wave function, some bit further down in X, around X of 0.1, uh, 
we find some very interesting structure. We, this is the region where the C quarks and gluons sit that emerge from these non-perturbative uh, vacuum uh, fields in QCD. So um, the, um, this region is very rich in structure and these um, um, particles here still carry some of the quantum numbers of the system. So, so uh, the charge, uh, isospin, spin, et cetera. If we go even further down in X, say below uh, 10 to the minus two, we enter another region. Um, the dominant particles there in the wave function are gluons, which are produced by uh, radiation processes, either perturbative or non-perturbative, and their density can become very large because they, they, they carry only a small momentum fraction, so there can be uh, many of them. And uh, you see in this way, if, I mean, if you adopt this view of the, 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 the parton picture and uh, the, the, the nucleon as a many body system, we can really, uh, we can almost read it like a book. We have different regions in the wave function um, where we see different types of particles. And, um, and we are, um, that are um, created and express different types of uh, interactions in the system. And we can also get an uh, immediate idea of what are the measurable properties of this system. Um, they are listed here. These are the particle number densities, including the, uh, the spin flavor dependence. We can also quantify the transverse spatial distributions of these um, partons on, on, on in the system on, on average and how it depends on X. Um, we can, to some extent, uh, quantify the transverse orbital motion um, in this system and things like spin orbit correlations. And um, we can even go beyond the level of one body densities and look at two particle correlations uh, in the system. And, and, and all these structures will be probed in measurements in uh, electron scattering. So um, let's have a look at what are actually the the number then the, the, the most basic quantity is the quark gluon number densities in this system. And um, here we're seeing a, um, a plot of the um, uh, quark gluon number densities here. Um, Sorry, these are, good question. Are we okay to, to ask questions during the lecture? Oh, absolutely. Sorry, I, I, I didn't, it, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, don't worry. I, 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 can we stop for a second on the previous slide? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, can we, can we, yes. Um, so I'm, I have a little bit of difficulty understanding the, the picture um, in particular, what sort of, what sort of variables does the relative weights. So if I understood correctly, the wave function is gonna be some coherent superposition of all of those yeah. different possibilities, right? Having valence quarks. So what determines the relative weight between that that decomposition, like what kinematical variables determines like, okay, in this regime, we really can think of this as valence quarks. Um, very good question. So first, let me say that um, this wave function is a, a concept we keep in the back of our head. It's not what we use for actual calculations or for describing processes. What we will do is we will um, uh, boil this down to single particle densities, which are like uh, projections of the wave function where we, uh, we lose a lot of information. But nevertheless, it's very useful to have this picture in the, in the back of your head. But now to your question, um, what determines the weight of these configurations is the um, um, the, the interactions in the system. You can think of the, the valence quarks as a kind of source that's hit at large X. And then through, um, through the interactions available to them by QCD, they build up the other components uh, or of, the wave, uh, of the wave function. And so it's a combination as usually of like strength, the, the strength of the coupling and the phase space that is available that, that determines how, how these uh, um, the, the weight of these components. And we're gonna see on the next slide exactly how this is expressed in the, in the particle densities, which are measurable and, 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 um, uh, and objectively defined. 
and and maybe at a more trivial level what this um this uh i'm having difficulty picturing in my brain the like if i want to study some hadron that is like there in space and thinking about things moving relativistically inside and I, I, I'm, I, are we putting the hadron in some frame where the hadron is moving really fast? So... Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's it's a it's a um it's a way of looking at the hadron. Absolutely. So so you can you can look at the hadron at rest. Absolutely, and you can you can do your calculations using this uh, what's called imaginary time correlation functions for slowly moving hadrons. You can derive all the structure. All fine. You just don't have a picture of this particle content. In, in, in this form in the in the in the hadron at rest. So in particular, the, the the thinking of a hadron as made up of valence quarks, valence quarks is not very accurate if I am thinking of like the hadrons inside of my body. Um, short answer yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. All right. Okay. So only yeah. that frame in which Thanks for moving because I want to overcome. Um, um, let's let's take a step back. So, um, in this, this these are um, essentially relativistic systems. So um, we can look at them in various frames, and the the the, the apparent structure they present will be completely different from frame to frame, and it's actually very profound how they are related, how these structures are related in, in, uh, in different frames. So uh, I'm presenting here a, a, a view, which is um, particularly suitable for, for um, discussing the structure in a particle based way, and which also can be naturally connected to the uh, scattering experiments in, in the probing platonic structure. There are other, this is not the only view, and there are other characteristics of hadrons that, that you might better discuss in, in, in other frames. For example, if you do spectroscopy or so, you might well do that with uh, imaginary time correlation functions for slowly moving hadrons. You, you don't have to adopt this here. Huh? But, huh? So could we, could we explore on the lattice those sort of like or valence quark picture if we were able to compute correlation functions at really high momentum? Um, the, um, this kind of question that to answer that properly requires some some more like preliminaries. I would suggest that we, we, we do this maybe in a, in a discussion session. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But, um, but yes. The, um. I have a shorter a shorter question. What is the typical momentum scale um, of the vacuum fluctuations? That's a that's a very good question. Um, and it, this is um, what um, so um, in this picture that um, I presented here, the typical momentum scale of these vacuum fluct of the vacuum fluctuations shown here is around 0.3 Fermi, which is still shorter than the hadronic size of one Fermi, but these are not the only vacuum fluctuations. There are others of the, of the scale of one Fermi or so. So um, the, um, as I said, for the existence of this parton picture, what we assumed for the moment is that there is some non-perturbative scale from vacuum fluctuations, and we have to look at a hadron that moves with a momentum that is much larger. But the, the proper way to derive this picture is from QCD from factorization of scattering processes, and we'll, we'll get to that in a in a second. Can you really quickly just talk about the picture? Like, wh what is the picture there? What are the lines? Um, the lines here. Um, yeah, the lines, the lines are lines, um, some lines going one way. Lines are uh, uh, quarks and antiquarks that uh, move now on uh, trajectories that uh, uh, along the hadron. Um, direction on, along the direction of the hadron momentum with a large momentum. So they're, 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 um, they essentially propagate along uh, with the speed of light along straight lines. You can think of them as having um, a, a fixed um, transverse position or impact parameter and carrying a certain uh, fraction of the hadron's longitude momentum. So these are quarks, anti-quarks, and gluons that all um, 
or modes that move along the direction of the hardware momentum. And, uh, um, and in a minute, we will see that they, are, they can be properly defined with a resolution scale of QCD. The resolution scale essentially limits their, their transverse momentum. Okay, very, yeah, very good. Now this, this, um, this picture is, uh, is exactly um, intended to um, how say um, stimulate our imagination and 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 these um, uh, these are very profound questions and uh, don't don't hesitate to answer to to uh, to ask them. Um, but um, let's have a look at um, what we actually know about the most basic characteristic of the system, which is its particle content or the quark gluon number densities. So um, these um, Number densities are essentially a function of uh, uh, the longitude momentum fraction of the uh, partons. Partons now means either quarks, antiquarks, or gluons. And they also, they also depend on the uh, resolution scale, which, um, if, uh, which um, defines the transverse momentum range that this is uh, in the, or the, the, the transverse momentum. In the, um, included in this uh, um, wave function that we saw. And here's a summary plot um, that, uh, of the particle densities extracted from a, a, a global analysis of various scattering processes. This will be discussed further in the uh, lecture by uh, Nobuo Sato. You see, so this shows X times these number densities as a function of the momentum fraction X. And now um, you can see that depending on where in X we're looking, uh, we see very different types of uh, particles. So if you look at um, X around uh, 0.3 or larger, then uh, which is here, then you see we're, we're practically only seeing what's called U valence and D valence quark densities. The valence quark densities are defined as the difference between the quark and the anti-quark densities. Um, if we go uh, a little bit down, like X around 10 to the minus one, we see the, um, um, C, the uh, uh, anti-quarks, also called C quarks coming in. So we have a non-zero U bar and D bar density. And you see that they are not equal. So they, they carry um, um, uh, flavor or isospin quantum numbers. And you also see that the gluon density comes in. The gluon density is shown divided by 10. Otherwise, it wouldn't fit on that, uh, on that scale at small x. And if we go further down in x, so like 10 to the minus 2 or 10 to the minus 3, then you see that the gluon density becomes uh, uh, totally uh, dominant. So they, they are the most prevalent uh, uh, particles in the system. But this is really... Um, this is really a statement about the basic particle content of the nucleon in QCD, which we can uh, think of in the in the context of this parton picture. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I just have a question. So. I guess the it seems like the gluon density is just blowing up, but uh, but it has to saturate somewhere. Is there like a physical? Um, that we, can... we 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 get to that in the um in the next lecture. In, oh, okay. In, in the second lecture, mm -hmm. so um, yeah, the yes, um, there are mechanisms at work that make the gluon density uh, um, uh, saturate, but. We'll, we'll discuss this some other time. Yeah. All right, so um, this is the basic particle content uh, of the nucleon in QCD as extracted from experiments, which really uh, kind of quantifies of what we mean by these different regions in the, in the structure of the hadron. So um, now um, let's get to another technique, which is... Um, uh, essential for establishing this picture. This is uh, this now uh, gets to scattering processes 
on this hadron, uh, on, uh, on, on the hadron in the parton picture. And um, this is called the, this is called uh, factorization. This will be about how we include radiation and the scale dependence in this, uh, in this parton picture of, of hadron structure. So imagine that we do a scattering process on uh, our hadron at a momentum transfer that is much Q square that is much larger than the um, hadronic scale, than the typical hadronic scale. Um, and um, then we can, and this, this has nothing to do with the momentum of the fast moving hadron. So we can do such scattering process in any frame, but right now we're, we're, we're adopting this part on picture where a hadron moves with almost infinite momentum. And we, uh, we do a scattering process with some uh, momentum transfer Q squared that has a finite value that is much larger than the uh, hadronic scale. Then we can do uh, the following uh, organization or we can separate um, uh, the um, um, modes of the system according to uh, the scale. So we will have uh, modes that have transverse momenta of the order Q square, which are associated with the scattering process here. And we'll have, and, and we, and we have modes with transverse momenta of the order of some fixed scale mu square, which does not, uh, uh, which is of the order of a, a hadronic scale, which we associate with um, hadron structure. And the region in transverse momenta between these two scales will be covered by uh, QCD radiation. So it's a very basic like a, a approximation technique, how we separate the modes uh, of the system contributing to a scattering process into two different classes. We, start, we, st we come in with a uh, set of modes that are collinear to the hadron and have transverse momenta of the order of some fixed scale mu, which essentially defines our, our wave function or our particle density. Then um, um, these modes um, build up or, um, um, or they, they experience QCD radiation and this QCD radiation builds up transverse momenta all the way up to uh, Q square. So this is a, um, as a, as a very basic technique um, called uh, factorization. This will be discussed in more detail in, uh, in uh, Nobuo's lecture. We just want to look at it here in, in the context of our um, uh, uh, wave function picture. So what this essentially does is it, it, it gives a proper definition of this partonic structure in QCD. Namely, it, it, it says that we have a, a scale mu that defines uh, the, the transverse momentum content of our uh, uh, parton distribution. And, um, in, and then in a scattering process, we, um, and, and we probe transverse momenta that are much larger and that are built up by, by uh, radiation processes. There's a very basic uh, picture and this, this can be applied to um, a whole set of different scattering processes. And depending on the final state we want to produce, we, we, um, um, we go about in different ways summing up this, this uh, radiation. So for example, if we do inclusive scattering, which we'll see in a second, where we just look at the total cross section for, for this uh, um, uh, electron to scatter on the hadron, then um, we essentially allow all possible radiation here, uh, it can materialize in the final state. If you do semi-inclusive scattering where we observe some hadron and we say it must have a transverse momentum of this and that, then we are uh, implicitly restricting the QCD radiation here and we're, um, 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 we're, we're summing it up in a different way. And uh, if you look at exclusive scattering where we say, um, there is nothing but our original hadron in the final state. Then we only allow for radiation that uh, is uh, 
emitted and, uh, uh, and, and absorbed again within the same scattering process. And we get a different type of, uh, um, um, uh, say, uh, treatment. So you will see this later. I mean, in, in, uh, in the other lectures, that these are called, this technique for summing up this radiation, this is called evolution equations. And there are, are different types of evolution equations exactly adapted to these situations of inclusive, semi-inclusive, and exclusive scattering. So another thing to be said at this point is, um, so we've, we've constructed, we've appealed to the notion of a wave function. We've constructed this, this, this uh, mental image of a, a wave function of the fast moving hard one, but that wave function has way too much information and it's not a practical way of doing calculations. So what we do in actual calculations or what is actually measured in scattering processes is, is densities derived from that wave function. Density means that we, uh, um, we take a wave function and wave function complex conjugate. And we, uh, we say we fix the momentum of one particle and we integrate out, we trace out all the other uh, degrees of freedom and look at uh, just the probability to find a certain particle in that, uh, in that system. So um, in all that follows, hadron structure will be described by particle densities, which are certain reductions of the uh, wave functions. And um, now it's, it, it's time for some uh, formulas, but they will be uh, very, uh, uh, very mild. So um, what we actually measure in these scattering processes are particle densities or number densities of quarks in this fast moving nucleon state, which can be expressed as is done uh, here. So in this original parton picture, this um, density uh, has the form of um, the matrix element of the number operator. This is A dagger A. This is the, uh, the uh, in, in, in field theory, this is the, the um, Num uh, the the, the um, uh, number operator measuring the number of quanta in a in a certain mode. So this is say some a dagger a for quarks or gluons measuring the number of particles with a longitudinal momentum x times p in the Hadron direction and transverse moment integrated over transverse momenta um, and uh, uh, up to the scale u. So this is really like the, the and this, this matrix element is taken in our uh, fast moving uh, hadronic state. So this is really the, the, the elementary, I think like operator definition of the parton density. And this can be, um, this is still specific to this fast moving hadron, but this, this density can be uh, also expressed in a, in, a, in a much more general way using the formalism of what's called second quantization, uh, namely as a correlation function of quark fields or, uh, with some um, uh, spatial separation that is on the light cone. So the, um, this representation is, equi is completely equivalent to the other one. I, I, I will not uh, show that here. It will be uh, discussed later in this school. Um, so, um, but um, this is the form in which the, um, most of the theoretical analysis of these uh, parton densities um, are, uh, are done. So um, as it, we introduce them as number densities of quarks and gluons in a fast moving hard one state, but they can be equivalently expressed as just correlation functions of the uh, elementary QCD fields, quark fields, or gluon fields inside a hadron state now with arbitrary momentum, but where these fields are separated by a light-like uh, uh, distance. And um, these densities are usually in, in Feynman diagrams. They're represented in this form, as you probably saw. So this is like this um, typically like second quantization formalism that we have the the, 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 um, uh, this operator is uh, uh, psi bar psi is represented by, by two lines coming out of a blob that represents this nucleon density with the incoming and outgoing nucleon state. So in this way, you will see it 
in calculations that are done using Feynman diagrams, etc. But keep in mind that it's all equivalent to this wave function that we, uh, um, or, or the, the, in, a, in a fast moving hadron that uh, we introduced earlier. So um, at this time, it's important to state some of the properties of these parton densities, again, without um, uh, uh, giving you a detailed proof or, or, or uh, justification. So these um, densities are rigorously defined as um, matrix elements of second quantized QCD operators. They are renormalized at a scale mu. Their scale dependence is uh, described by um, so-called uh, evolution equations, which in, our, in the parton picture, as we saw, do nothing but summing up the uh, radiation um, um, that is defined into these densities. Um, these densities are um, process independent. They can be measured in scattering processes, but they are actually independent of the specifics of the process and universal to the extent that factorization holds. So the same distribution can appear in multiple processes as directed by factorization. And we can do a global analysis uh, collecting information on these densities from uh, various sources. These um, parton distributions also obey certain sum rules. For example, the integral of over X of the quark minus anti-quark density uh, just gives the, the total number of quarks or the, the charge in the system, which is a, a conserved quantity. It's uh, independent of the scale. Um, and we will see other uh, such, uh, sum rules um, related to the spin, for example, of the nucleon later on. Um, the parton distributions are also computable um, in lattice QCD because they are defined now in this way as correlation functions of certain operators in the nucleon at, uh, at any momentum of the state. They, they can be computed using lattice QCD or other non-perturbative methods. Um, there are various extensions of these concepts. Um, for example, one could look at the spin-dependent part on distributions where the, the uh, uh, both the nucleon state is polarized or the uh, quark uh, density that we're measuring is the one in a, in a particular spin state polarized along or opposite to the uh, direction of polarization of the nucleon. Um, one can even define something what's called generalized particle distributions where the um, momentum of the incoming and outgoing nucleon state are not the same. So these, these objects then have combined the characteristics of a particle density with those of a, of a form factor. And they have a very interesting uh, physics applications. And so overall, these particle densities are really um, principal tools for uh, characterizing Hadron structure in QCD. Um, this summarizes the first part um, of our in, uh, um, of this exposition. So we've uh, seen that a fast moving Hadron state, the momentum much larger than the typical momentum of vacuum fluctuations, decouples from the vacuum fluctuations and becomes a closed system that, in a certain sense, can be described by a wave function. The hadron state in this picture has components with vari variable particle number, which are connected by the uh, uh, QCD interactions. A rigorous definition of the parton densities can be provided in the context of factorization of high momentum transfer processes. These involve uh, uh, um, concepts such as the second quantized QCD operators and renormalization. And um, altogether, what this does is it allows us to think of the hadron as a many body system with physical characteristics, as a particle content, spatial size, orbital motion, correlations, et cetera. And we will see in the next lecture how they can be uh, probed in actual um, scattering experiments. Um, it's probably a good time to 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 take a break. Yeah. Then uh, any questions? Yeah, we can.
I mean, we can, we can, we can have coffee and, and, and talk over. I mean, we, I'd be happy to take break. questions now or, or anytime. Yeah. We take a 15 minutes break and we come back. Yeah.